Considered to be primarily worshipped by the Sumerians, the ancient god of wind, air, earth and storms would also come to be worshipped by the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Hurrians and the Assyrians. Unlike many of the primordial beings in Mesopotamian mythology, Enlil had a much more prominent role and was certainly more popular than the others in terms of worship. Otherwise thought to be the Mesopotamian god of the atmosphere, Enlil was one of the first descendants of the primordial beings and would come to make up the trinity along with his father Anu who controlled the sky and the heavens and his brother Enki who controlled the water. Together this triad would rule over the heavens, the earth and the sea. Yet despite their equal importance, it is Enlil who would gain much of the attention from the mortals who worship them, and it was Enlil who would outshine them, from his legendary tales of the flood to his salacious exploits in the Book of Gilgamesh. In fact, in some tellings, Enlil was considered to be so above the other gods that they could not even look at him, for he was too powerful. In today's episode of Mesopotamian Mythology, we'll be exploring the origins of Enlil, learning about what made him so special and dissecting a few of his most popular stories, where he demonstrates the traits of both the hero and the villain. The name Enlil is derived from the Sumerian word En, meaning Lord, and Lil, meaning Wind, thus making him Lord Wind, or in other translations, Lord Storm. Alternatively, another translation of Lil is thought to paint the deity as a phantom or spirit, that manipulates the wind, or perhaps that Enlil was thought of as the personification of the wind itself. But there is some debate as to what the actual meaning of this Lil means, with others suggesting that the Lord Storm interpretation painted him as a destructive god that brought about devastation, and that he served as more of a storm deity. This can be reinforced by some of his nicknames in various texts, where he is described as a raging storm or a wild bull. But as far as the Sumerians went, Enlil was a far more benign deity, one who would be considered to be a fatherly king and the supreme ruler of everything in existence. Another idea proposes that as the Lord Wind, Enlil was both the essences of the gentle wind and the terror of the hurricane, for both were thought of as his breath and thus, his word or command. Yet another point of contention is what Enlil looked like, considering in Mesopotamian iconography, he was never actually depicted in human form, but instead was represented by a horned cap. This cap, which consisted of seven pairs of ox horns, would become something of an essential symbol of divinity and divine power, and would come to influence many subsequent cultures, where horned caps were a consistent piece of attire amongst deities. Yet another physical consistency seen amongst Enlil comes from poems in the early dynastic period, which sees the god create the matter, an agricultural pickaxe and or digging tool used by the Sumerians. Legends, as well as the stone tablet known as the Song of the Ho from Sumeria, detail that the pickaxe was a glorious thing to behold, and was made from pure gold. Supposedly, Enlil gifted the pickaxe to the humans, who would then use it in the building of cities and for agricultural uses, as well as being weaponized. Like how Prometheus brought fire to man in Greek mythology and gave man the means for warmth food and crafting, Enlil can be seen from a Sumerian perspective to have given man the means to farm, build and defend themselves via the pickaxe. There does exist another tale to support the idea of Enlil's advocation of agriculture and that is from the Sumerian poem Enlil chooses the farmer god. The poem goes exactly as the title suggests, where Enlil creates two gods, Emish and Enten a farmer and a shepherd. The two gods would come to argue over their responsibilities and it would take Enlil's mediation to bring about reconciliation between the two deities. 
But in any case, Enlil appeared to be keen on establishing farms on the earth, and appeared to want humans to thrive on their own, with minimal intervention from himself. This is furthermore established in the Song of the Ho, where the separation of his mother and father, the earth and the sky, was a means to allow the humans to cultivate on the earth. He is said to have dug a hole in the ground, and from that hole sprang forth the very first humans, where Enlil himself explains how to farm and provide for themselves. He bestows upon the humans the legendary hoe, and with that, the humans go on to thrive as they do. Yet another version of mankind's creation exists on another Sumerian clay tablet known as the debate between sheep and grain, which tells us about the two gods Ashnan and Utu, those who represented grain and wool respectively. It's understood that in the beginning, Anu had forgotten to create grain and sheep, and so mankind did not have bread or clothes, and thus were living like animals. It is then Enki who suggests to Enlil to give Ashnan and Utu to humanity so that they can grow food and clothe themselves. Amongst all this, the Sumerians would believe that Enlil could be identified as a culmination of all the stars in the southern sky, which in a similar fashion was true of Anu, who made up the stars of the equatorial sky and his brother Enki, who made up the stars of the northern sky. Interestingly, whilst the path of the stars in Enlil's orbit were continuous around the North Celestial Pole, Anu's and Enki's were believed to interweave at various points during the year. It can be said that this was a reflection of the power of Enlil, for where Anu's and Enki's stars would occasionally emerge, Enlil's would remain independent perhaps symbolic of the deity himself, who could not be impressed upon by the other gods, nor influenced by them in any way. This is evident in his worship, that which at some point was almost unanimous amongst the Sumerians, particularly in the city-state of Nippur, where Enlil was considered as the patron god. It is in Nippur where the Ika temple was located, that which was Enlil's temple, that he was said to have built himself. Translated, Ika meant mountain house, and was believed to be the mooring rope of heaven and earth, that which was something of a conduit between the heavens and the earth. It is believed that Enlil's popularity began to accelerate during the 24th century BC, when the importance of his father Anu began to decline. It was around this time where soul devotion to Anu began to wane, and Enlil was soon invoked alongside Anu in various inscriptions. Before long, Anu was thought of less and less, and Enlil superseded his father in maintaining priority during worship. Unlike with his father Anu, we have some tangible ideas of how worship of Enlil took shape amongst his believers, and this included feeding the god by placing food at his statue. The Sumerians believed that the statues built of their gods were the actual embodiments of the gods themselves, and so they took it upon themselves to feed and even clothe these gods, and committed much of their lives to ensuring the statues were looked after. This was doubly so for Enlil, who was considered a fatherly deity, one who looked after his people and offered them care and protection in exchange for theirs. It is believed that the worshippers of Enlil really believed they owed him life, and were not shy of demonstrating their gratitude. Even mortal rulers of Mesopotamia would seek to model their reigns after Enlil, and would try to emulate his characteristics in their duties. In fact, it was not beneath the rulers of the old world to make long journeys to the Ika temple in Nippur, in an effort to pay homage to Enlil in person, and to seek recognition from him, so as to legitimise their own rule. In exchange for his blessings, many rulers were thought to offer up their own lands to Enlil, 
as well as to provide him with gifts from the finest of jewels to earn his favour. We see such dedication to Enlil exemplified by the Amorites, where Amorite kings would proclaim that Enlil had chosen them as monarchs, and thus could be disputed by none. It's also understood that Nippur might have been one of the only Sumerian city-states that did not have a palace, because it was believed and agreed upon, even by the rulers, that Nippur was the centre of Enlil's cult, and that the Ika temple, that being his house, was Enlil's claim upon the land, and should therefore not have been challenged. It's easy to see why Enlil achieved such popularity considering his role within the mythology, where there exist many fascinating tales about him, including his affairs with his consort Ninlil, his anger at humanity which preceded the Great Flood, and the wars against the other gods. In the main source of information we have in regards to the Sumerian creation myth known as Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and the Netherworld, we are told that in the beginning there was only Namu, the primeval sea. But when Namu gave birth to Anu, the sky, and Ki, the earth, the two mated and gave birth to Enlil. With his birth, Enlil proceeded to separate the sky from the earth, and with his father carrying off the skies, Enlil took dominance over the earth. It's interesting to note here that we can see Enlil as a catalyst to his parents' separation, and that it was with his birth that the two were driven apart. From the very beginning of his existence, Enlil, according to the Sumerians, had a dramatic effect not just on the earthly domain, but upon the other gods, whose entire nature and lives were restructured by his will. Further exploits during Enlil's inception are not documented, but considering that his very first deed upon being born was the separation of the elements, I'd say he'd earned something of a break. Instead, we catch up with Enlil in one of his more randy excursions, as told to us in the myth of Enlil and Ninlil, a 3rd century story written on clay tablets in the 3rd millennium BC. The 152 line poem that contains some missing fragments describes the affair between Enlil and the goddess known as Ninlil, she who would be considered to be the Lady of the Wind. Her parentage is not known for sure, but some propose that she too was the daughter of Anu and Ki, in perhaps a subsequent reconciliation between the two. Others propose that Ninlil was born between Anu and Namu, the sea, or that Namu had simply produced her individually. Nonetheless, the poem here describes Ninlil's mother as Nunbasagunu, an obscure mother goddess thought to be a deity of barley in Mesopotamia. It is she who instructs Ninlil to go and bathe in the river, and it is here we see the more human traits of desire, passion, curiosity and temptation embodied in the gods themselves. Before leaving however, Nunbasagunu warns her daughter about the potential of romantic advances from men, and that she should be wary of strangers who approach her, most notably the one known as Enlil, who she would encounter if she strayed too far into the river. With this in mind, and with what some might say is a seed of curiosity planted in her head, Ninlil heads for the river, vigilant to the advances that her mother had warned her about. It is here that, lo and behold, Enlil spots Ninlil bathing, and approaches her in an effort to seduce her, just like her mother had warned. Ninlil sees Enlil moving towards her, and heeding her mother's words, she flees to the other side of the river, only for Enlil to navigate his way around and meet her there. Unable to escape him, Enlil and Ninlil end up lying down together on the bank, where one thing leads to another and the two end up conceiving a son, who would become Nana, the moon god. It's interesting to note the themes of temptation littered throughout the story, 
those which in a way are almost parallel to the temptation story found in the Bible. Where God warns Adam and Eve about the tree of knowledge and to keep away from it, Ninlil's mother warns her about Enlil. Whilst Adam and Eve and Ninlil offer up some resistance, they are ultimately failed by their own temptation and curiosity, which sees them disregard the warnings of their superiors. Rather interestingly, Enlil appears to take on the role of the serpent, for he serves not only as the tempter, but as the prize itself. Some might view Enlil here as the villain, as he seduces a young woman in a manner that was not considered proper. Furthermore, we understand that Enlil's actions were vilified by the gods themselves, and he was deemed as a reprehensible character, for he is then arrested and exiled into Kerr, the Sumerian underworld. Yet despite what the other gods deem as ritually impure, Ninlil appears to have fallen for Enlil, and proceeds to follow him into his exile. The story then takes on less of a take on the evils of temptation, and instead becomes a story of forbidden love, where the original tempter adopts the role as more of an underdog hero, or at least one who might be rooted for. No longer is Enlil insidious, perverted, or otherwise a predator, but instead a victim of his peers, who come between him and his love. Ninlil's following of him gives us an idea that Enlil isn't the bad guy that her mother warned her about, and instead someone she very much wants to be with. Either that, or just a classic case of Stockholm Syndrome. But still, Ninlil does follow her heart, and ends up speaking to several men upon her journey, including the keeper of the city gate, the man who guards the Sumerian river to the underworld, and lastly the ferryman upon that river, all those who would have seen Enlil after his exile. Now unbeknownst to Ninlil, Enlil had taken the form of each of these men. So when Ninlil speaks to each one, she's actually speaking to her lover. Why Enlil takes on the form of each of these men isn't really detailed, and whilst it might seem like he does this to test her loyalty, or to find out how much he actually means to her, the conclusion of the story shows us that this isn't the case at all. Whilst in disguise as these three men, Enlil proceeds to seduce Ninlil, and she ends up having sex with all three of these men. Upon each encounter, Ninlil conceives a god, including Nurgle and Ninazor, the underworld gods, and Enbilulu, the god of the rivers and canals. Now many of you might be thinking that Ninlil is most certainly an untrustworthy character, and surely one that is ritually impure, as the gods had deemed Enlil. But instead, praise is bestowed upon Ninlil and the fertility between herself and Enlil. There appear to be no moral overtones of Ninlil being unfaithful, nor any that scrutinise Enlil's trickery by adopting guises to seduce her. Instead, the whole thing is forgotten, and neither character appears to demonstrate resentment towards the other. Some have theorised that Enlil took on these disguises so as to hide himself from the other gods, and that Ninlil, deep down, knew that it was him, and so technically, neither was being unfaithful or immoral, but instead orchestrating loopholes in an effort to be together. But the text does not provide such reasons, and it can also be said that this simply wasn't so much of an ethical issue for the Sumerians, and merely a way for them to bring about multiple pregnancies that would bear more of the gods. Whilst the story serves as much more of a coming of age story for Enlil, we later see him as a much more revered deity, one who is not challenged at all by his fellow gods, and one who has complete dominance over the earth. In the Akkadian version of the Flood story for example, Enlil comes across as far more severe beyond his youthful years, and not one who tolerates anything that irks him. He seemed to be short-tempered, brash, and hardly the compassionate god 
that the Sumerians had previously portrayed. Whilst the flood story was originally recorded in the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh, how the flood originated is unclear due to the original text being damaged. But in the Akkadian version, Enlil is the cause of the flood, for he wished to annihilate humanity, who in his view were making too much noise, and that they were keeping him up at night. Here we see the hero Udnapishtim, warned by Ea, the Babylonian equivalent of Enki, that the flood is coming, similarly to how God warns Noah in the biblical version. Enlil's flood lasts for seven days, and as intended, humanity is drowned, all except Udnapishtim and his family, who were spared by Ea. Of course, when Enlil learns that these handful of humans survived, he is outraged, for not only were his wishes undermined by the other gods, but so was his power. The fact that humans had survived the almighty flood poked holes in the idea of his omnipotence, and the mere sight of them made Enlil's blood boil. But Enlil's son Ninurta vouches for humanity, and is able to pacify his father, asking him to spare the surviving humans, and that next time, he should ensure population control by introducing less catastrophic measures. This would ensure that the humans did not increase beyond the gods' desired numbers, and would also be a kinder way to shuffle the humans off the mortal coil. Of course, Ninurta does suggest utilising wild animals and famines instead, which I suppose is better than complete desolation in the form of a flood, but hardly reassuring either. Agreeing to his son's suggestions, Enlil goes to Utnapishtim and his wife, where he grants them immortality for their loyalty to the gods. In this version, we can see Enlil painted in a different light, as not just a vengeful god, but one who didn't think too highly of humanity either. He does not think twice about destroying them, and does not seem to try and reason with them in an effort to establish peace. The humans irk Enlil, and for this, they are obliterated. This is not synonymous with the fatherly essence that was usually attributed to Enlil by the Sumerians, and he certainly doesn't come across as a protector, but instead, an annihilator. It could also be said that Enlil had a much darker, vengeful, and impatient side to him, and it's this dichotomy of his character that makes him all the more compelling, both as a character and as a god. It's usually the case that gods of his calibre are fair and just, with no capability of succumbing to vindictive actions, but with Enlil's desolation of the world, for keeping him up at night, we see a different type of god, one who is perhaps capricious, erratic, and maybe unstable. Of course, one might interpret the keeping him up at night part of the text not as the humans making too much noise, but the humans committing horrendous acts, ones that disturbed Enlil so much so that he deemed it best to get rid of them entirely. It would also explain why he is outraged that Udnapishtim survives, because it could be that he sees him as a cause of pain. Of course, after learning that Udnapishtim is a virtuous man, he comes to see the error of his ways, and realises that not all humans are wicked. With this, he acquiesces to Ninurta's suggestion of controlled, smaller scale catastrophes, and blesses Udnapishtim with immortality, perhaps as a reminder that there can be good men. It's interesting that Ninurta becomes the voice of reason for his father in the Akkadian version of the story, because in one Sumerian poem known as Lugail, it is Enlil who is seen to be given advice to Ninurta, and Enlil's fatherly nature is maintained. In this myth, Ninurta is anxious over an upcoming confrontation he has with the demon Asarg and Enlil is seen to help his son strategize and prepare, by communicating with him through his enchanted mace, Sharur. 
It goes to show how much faith that Enlil had in his son's ability. For giving his strength and power, it's probable that he could have defeated Asarg himself. Instead, he entrusted the duty to his son, and probably did so, so that Ninurta could earn his own glory, and craft a reputation that was outside of his father's shadow. It isn't the first time we see Ninurta entrusted with such a responsibility either, for in the Babylonian myth Anzu and the Tablet of Destinies, Anzu, a giant monstrous bird, steals the Tablet of Destinies from Enlil whilst he is preparing a bath. The Tablet of Destinies was thought to be a sacred clay tablet that granted Enlil his authority, and so you can imagine how detrimental it was that another being had stolen it. With the tablet in Anzu's possession, and with Enlil virtually powerless at this point, the other gods made an effort to destroy Anzu, but each of them failed. In the end, Ea suggests sending Ninurta, who manages to defeat Anzu and return the tablet to his father, thus restoring his authority. It's interesting to note that Ninurta does not seize the power for himself, even though he was most certainly in a position to do so, what with all the other gods having failed to stop Anzu. Ninurta had the perfect opportunity here to usurp his father by keeping the tablet for himself, but he does not even seem to entertain the idea. It might be said that such was the respect and reverence that the gods, including Ninurta, had for Enlil, in that even when he was at his weakest, they still served him and did not dare take advantage. Yet despite this recognition, not just from the other gods, but from the people who worshipped him, it did not stop Enlil's importance from declining in the years that the Babylonian king Hammurabi conquered Sumer. It's understood that the Babylonians did recognise Enlil, but under the name Elil, and that the Hurrians of the time would come to fuse him with their own god Kumabi. It would be another 200 years before Enlil was thought of again, where he was able to make something of a resurgence where the city of Nippur regained influence in the region during the Kassite period. But by 1300 BC, when the Assyrians came into power, Enlil was once again syncretized with the Assyrian national god Ashur, sometimes dubbed as the Assyrian Enlil. But 70 years later, the Elamites, an ancient civilization in what is now southwest Iraq, attacked Nippur and destroyed the cult of Enlil for good. With this, the head of the pantheon was assumed by Marduk, the national god of the Babylonians, who would come to overshadow Enlil and render the former god as merely an aspect of himself. A desecrated text from the Neo-Assyrian period between the 9th and 6th century BC provides a mythological narrative for the usurpation of Enlil by Marduk. Here we are told that Marduk led an army of the Anunnaki, deities who were the offspring of Anu, into the sacred city of Nippur, and there they wreaked havoc upon the land. This havoc would cause a flood, which saw the resident gods of Nippur, who were serving under Enlil, to retreat into the Eshumesha temple of Ninurta. When Enlil learns of Marduk's attack, he is enraged and orders the gods who had fled from him to return and to take both Marduk and his Anunnaki army as prisoners. Reluctantly, the gods at the Eshumesha temple return to face Marduk and are able to capture the Anunnaki, but they are not strong enough to defeat Marduk. With this, Marduk leads a revolt against the gods of Eshumesha, and is able to defeat every single one of them, as well as taking a total of 360 prisoners, that which included Enlil. What's compelling about this story is that it implied that Enlil actually got involved in the battle after commanding his gods to confront Marduk, and that even with him on the battlefield, Marduk was still victorious. We can appreciate not just the fall of Enlil, but also the power that Marduk must have wielded, 
For Enlil, a god who could destroy humanity with the summoning of a flood, or who could dominate his pantheon to the point that the others could not even look at him, becomes merely a prisoner of war. In fact, we even see Enlil proceed to plead with Marduk to spare the lives of the Eshumesha gods, something that the Sumerians could probably not have even conceived of their almighty Enlil. Still, despite the rise of Marduk, Enlil's temples still functioned hundreds of years after the apex of his worship, and whilst tribute was not paid to him in the way it once was, echoes of him still lingered in the region of Nippur. In fact, in some Babylonian beliefs, it was Anu and Enlil who had given Marduk his powers, and the transition of worship may have been seen less as a hostile takeover and more as a passing of the torch. Interestingly, the idea that Enlil decided which man would be ruler was still upheld by the Babylonians, who would still visit the holy city of Nippur to gain the blessing of their rulership. But by the 1st century BC, the Babylonians had turned their worship to the entity Bel, meaning Lord, and he was considered to be something of an amalgamation of Enlil, Marduk, and the god Dumizid. It was in the 1st century BC that the decline of Marduk also came about, where after the collapse of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, Enlil's statues and temples were destroyed by the Medes and the Persians, who wished to eradicate all association with Assyria, after having been conquered by them. With this, Enlil and all of his iterations faded into obscurity, and for the most part were largely forgotten, in favour of new gods, customs and worship. It goes without saying that Enlil's prominence was undeniable. Even after he had been usurped by Marduk, his many nicknames, including the Father of Gods, Father of the Black-Headed People, the Great Mountain, and King of All Lands, marked him as a precursor for all other gods that would come to follow, and certainly not one who would be entirely forgotten in the subsequent decades. Even more so, there existed a concept of Enlilship, a term that the Sumerians could apply to not only divine entities, but also those of the human race, to mark them out as having the utmost authority. Indeed, it would seem that Enlil's name alone was so powerful and so revered, that despite his fall, there would not be another Mesopotamian god quite like him thereafter. Let me know in the comments below if there are any more stories or facts about Enlil that I might have missed. And as always, if you've enjoyed today's episode on Mesopotamian Gods Explained, then don't forget to give it a like and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.